questions. And after our presentation tonight, we'll be back together again to answer your questions. So be listening during this presentation. You may say, I've got a question about that. We especially encourage questions that relate to that night's subject. And you could be sending those in on Facebook. And after the program, we're going to be talking about those. You know, we had a, we're off to a good start in our presentation last night based on the web traffic and the averages of the channels that uh, were carrying the bro uh, broadcast. I want to thank our friends at 3ABN, also on AFTV, Facebook, YouTube, and a number of different outlets. Well over 100,000 people were tuned in last night, and we know the programs that are archived are continuing to be viewed, so we just praise the Lord and hope that you're praying for these presentations because we're living in very unique times right now. And I should mention, heard my wife's voice out there, we do have a small studio audience here that is scattered in this amazing fax facility. And so uh, and we know that we have a, a big audience out there. You know, our presentation tonight, we're going to be talking about the lesson, Earth's Last Empire. And yes, the Bible prophecies do address this subject. But, you know, before I get into the subject, we like to get out on the streets and we've had our media team go out to some major cities and ask some relevant questions to kind of get a feel of what is the thinking out there in the general public regarding prophecy and dreams and Armageddon. And, well, I'll let you hear for yourself. All the way through, there are 2,000 prophecies that came true. The whole COVID epidemic um, and then some of the uh, weather situations. I think weather has been uh, an indicator of you know, God's angry. I think that no one could predict anything in the future because everything is so random and everything so, uh, like, it, it's like impossible to determine where things are headed to. I think all things are possible, to be honest with you. Uh, is it possible for someone to move something with their mind? Possibly. Uh, I, I can't, I, I'm an agnostic. I can't say one way or another who's right, who's wrong, because I don't have the answers myself. Yeah, it's possible. They're like, I mean, come on. I mean, like, for example, if I say uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to breathe in the next minute, that's knowing the future. Correct. Right? Armageddon, other than the movie, is probably be the end of the world. Angels will come down, the dead will rise, and uh, it'd be the Antichrist versus um, the angels. Um, Armageddon, it's the last day. Um, everything is destroyed, um, everyone dies. Well, Armageddon is supposed to be the final battle on the plains of Megiddo. Well, there you have it, friends. Uh, you can see that there's quite a, uh, a difference of opinion on some of these biblical prophecy Armageddon themes. And tonight we're going to be talking about Earth's last empire. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that there seems to be a battle between two cities taking place in Revelation that goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. In the very beginning, it talks about uh, Babylon. Uh, it was talked about Babel back then, and it also talks about um, Jerusalem, but it was called Salem. And the word Babylon is actually mentioned. By the way, Babylon means confusion. And you can tell from some of the interviews out there, there's a lot of confusion about Bible prophecy and the end of the world. But the word Babylon really um, is found seven times in the book of Revelation. Jerusalem is only found three times. Kingdom is found seven times also. But in order to understand how Babylon fits into Revelation, as I mentioned, out of the 404 verses in Revelation, 278 are found almost word for word somewhere else in the Bible. So going back in Revelation, we can see, well, reading in Revelation, I should say, we can see in Revelation 18, verse 21, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. Several times here in Revelation, it talks about the fall of Babylon. What does that mean? Who is Babylon? It talks about mystery Babylon in Revelation. Well, if you go back in the beginning, you find the first reference to Babylon in Revelation, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 10. Nimrod was the one who founded the city. But then we read in chapter 11 about following the flood, men wanted to make a name for themselves. God told them to go scatter, disperse, be fruitful and multiply. But they congregated. And instead of believing they wouldn't be destroyed with another flood, they thought, let's make a tower. 
make a name for ourselves so we can save ourselves in case we can't trust God. So Babylon and that whole tower being confused and confounded, it became a symbol for confusion in the Bible. It says, therefore its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And I'll tell you, friends, there's a lot of spiritual confusion in the world today. Now, when you jump ahead in the Bible to the book of Daniel, that's when Babylon really uh, reached its zenith. Because, you see, Jerusalem was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar II, this great king of ancient Babylon. And the people were carried off to Babylon. And they were held captive there. And so when it talks about Babylon conquering God's people and taking them away, there's this battle between the people of God and the kingdom of Babylon that we see playing out through the scriptures. So Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom ran roughly from 612 B.C. to 539 B.C. But if you go to Daniel chapter 2, and if you have your Bibles, you might turn there, it describes the king having a dream. After his kingdom was established and settled, he began to realize, you know, I built this up, but how long will it last? And uh, he, while he was thinking about the future and how long his kingdom would last, the Lord gave this powerful monarch uh, an incredible vivid dream. Now, some dreams are just the result of, you know, the strange things that happen during the day. I know I used to play a lot of racquetball. <laughs> Before COVID, I played more racquetball. And uh, I play so much that sometimes I'd be laying in bed. Karen's laying next to me, and I'd take my arm, and I'd swing it. She'd go, you okay? And I said, no, I was trying to make a shot. <laughs> I just <laughs> in my dream. And so, uh, you know, sometimes dreams come through the multitude of business, Solomon tells us. But sometimes we've had dreams that were extremely real and vivid. It's more like a vision. The king knew there was something different about this dream. And we're going to show you where you find in the Bible this dream. It's found in Daniel chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses... Let's see, I'm going to read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 through verse 35 that describes what the king saw. Then we'll go back and we'll talk about that story. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, and this great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly iron and partly clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth." Well, there you have that vision. We've done our best to kind of recreate that uh, vision so that you could see it and get it pictured in your mind. In fact, uh, on the shelf behind me, you might be wondering if you've seen a wide shot of the set here, we've got this uh, artifact. No, I just want to make sure nobody thinks that we're uh, at our amazing facts office that we're burning incense before statues. So that's forbidden in the Bible. This is sort of a, a representation or a, a reproduction of uh, what the king saw in his dream. We call him Melvin. I hope nobody here is named Melvin. But uh, anyway, so this dream outlines the history of the world. And so with this background, let's go ahead and get into our study for tonight. Going again through these studies with a question-answer format helps us to uh, ask the right questions and look in the Bible for the answers. By the way, I'm going to be giving a lot of Bible scriptures tonight. And so you can take notes. Of course, you can play these back later, and you can request the lessons and download them that will help you understand this. Question number one, why did God give the Babylonian king this dream? You read in Daniel 2, 28, he said, There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the last days. So what does this dream have to do with? What's going to be in the last days? He says, I'm telling you a secret. This dream is revealing something about the future. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, he did what monarchs used to do back then. And you remember in the Bible when the Pharaoh had this dream of the seven fat cows and the seven skinny ones and the seven fat ears of corn and the seven skinny ones and called in his wise men and said, what does this mean? 
and they weren't able to tell them. These great monarchs often had, they had magicians and sorcerers and advisors that went through all their different incantations to supposedly guide the king with their wisdom. And this was fairly common through uh, China and Babylonia and Egypt and many of the empires. So he called in his wise men and his magicians and sorcerers and said, I've had this dream. I know that it's a divine dream. It's different. God was telling me something. I felt the intensity of it. Tell me what the dream means. And they said, okay, that's why we were on the king's payroll. Tell us the dream and we'll manufacture, I mean, we'll tell the king what it dream, what it means. Oh, they were really good at concocting things, you know, but um, the king said, you know, it's already becoming fuzzy. I don't know if you've ever had a dream before that you think, wow, and then you try and tell it to someone a little later and you go, ah, it's getting hard to remember because the part of your brain that does dreaming in your uh, brain levels, it's not the same uh, lucid part of your brain you think with, the conscious brain. And so they're often separated by a veil and it's hard to recall. So the king said, look, I want to find out if you guys are authentic. If you really have divine insight, Tell me the dream, then I'll know you can tell me the interpretation and you're not just making something up. Well, they began to stall and they said, well, that's, that's a little unreasonable. There's no king that would ever ask his magicians or his wise men something like that. You tell us the dream and we will tell you the interpretation. And he was getting more and more frustrated with them until finally the king, knowing the importance of this and beginning to doubt the authenticity of his wise men, he issued a decree that they should all be gathered and executed if they couldn't tell him what his dream was and what the interpretation was. When the king's counselors failed to reveal and interpret the dream, what was Nebuchadnezzar's command? He actually began to get his legal counsel together. He said, we're going to get a decree because if you're going to wipe out all the wise men in your kingdom, you need to make it official. And he was assembling them and getting the paperwork done. He says, then if you can't tell me the dream, I'm going to have you all executed. The king commanded to destroy all of the wise men of Babylon. Now, part of the problem in this story is that in the kingdom of Babylon, there were four Hebrews that were serving in the king's cabinet, and they were sort of intern wise men. They were junior wise men, so to speak. You read in chapter 1 how the king had tested them and found them ten times wiser than all of his magicians and astrologers. They were not invited to this first gathering where the king said, tell me my dream. And so Daniel went to the guard that was gathering the wise men and talking about exterminating them. And he said, why is the king's decree so hasty? Uh, ask the king if he wants to know the dream to give me some time and I'll tell him. So when Daniel learned about the death decree, what did he ask of the king and what did he tell his friends? <clears throat> Daniel went in and he desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Now, he wasn't stalling. He's basically saying, give me a couple of days and I will tell the king what the interpretation is. How could Daniel say something that, that outrageous and audacious? How would he know that he could do that? That was a pretty risky thing to say. Well, you know, you read in Daniel chapter 2, it says, Daniel then goes to his house. He makes the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are the Jewish names for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. And these four young men gave, and now look in Daniel chapter 1, verse 7. Why did Daniel have this confidence? As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. It says that in chapter 1. That's why Daniel had confidence in chapter 2 that he could tell the king what his, matter, his uh, message was or what his vision was. But they prayed. They knew that these secrets only belonged to God. If you knew that uh, your life depended on having an answer, you had to dream someone else's dream, you'd have a pretty healthy prayer meeting. And I'm sure those four young men were praying their hearts out that night. But eventually they had peace and they drifted off to sleep. And what do you know? Daniel ended up having this vivid dream and he knew it was the dream of the king. And th the next day, he then uh, related this. Question four, when the Lord revealed the dream to Daniel, to whom did he give praise and credit? credit? He didn't take it for himself. He knew that the glory belonged to God. 
it says that they gathered and they thanked the Lord. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets, and he's made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the last days. It's emphasizing the context of what this dream is about and how this dream relates to you today. So you've got to listen carefully. We're going to find out where we are in the scope of history. Got a lot of information tonight. The Bible says that God and God only really can see the beginning from the end. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no one, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. God can declare from ancient times things that haven't yet happened. So in the dream, and we read it, you saw it on the screen, what are the two objects that the king saw in that dream that especially stood out? Well, first of all, he said, Thou, O king, saw us, and behold, a great image. Now, this, I think, in itself is something that is very telling. In the Bible, uh, you know what the second commandment is? Do not make the likeness of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. Do not make images. Do not bow down to images. But in Babylon, they were famous for idolatry as they were in many of the pagan cultures of the world. And so the very fact that this statue is of a great image, it evidently is an image of a man. You look in Daniel chapter 7, back Daniel chapter 8, it talks about these visions of beasts, and it tells you that they're beasts. But this one, because it's got chests and arms and legs and toes, we're pretty sure that it's the image of a man. It represents man's kingdom on earth. When you get to Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes a great image, that is six cubits by 60 cubits, and probably six cubits wide, six cubits deep, six wide, 60 tall, 666. Six, well, you find that image in Revelation also. And so this image represented the religion, the kingdoms of man in the world that were at odds or opposing the kingdom of God. Notice, the king's wise men did not have real power. Who was it that could finally tell the king what the answer was? It was the Jew in the court. In the days of Pharaoh, the wise men could not tell the Pharaoh about the dream. Who had the answer? It was Joseph, the Jew, in the court. And you'll see this happening many times through history, that God gave his people that wisdom. That's why this book, the Bible is a book. Paul says God committed the holy oracles to the Jewish nation. And so you've got this um, two polar opposites. This idol, it's just this image, it's a big idol represents counterfeit worship. Those are the battles you're going to see in the last days between those who worship God and those who worship the beast and his image. So one thing you see is his great image. The other thing you see is there is a stone cut without hands. Now that's going to come up a little later. You see, when the Jews made an altar, they were told, do not lift up your tool upon it. If you lift up your tool upon it, you have polluted it. You've profaned it. I don't want you to be tempted to carve that stone, even if it's an altar, into anything ornate because I don't want you to be tempted to worship idols. I want you to simply take raw stone. So when it says this stone is cut without man's hands, it's talking about God's truth. Jesus is the rock of ages. Christ said, he that hears these words of mine, he is the wise man who builds on the rock. And David brought down Goliath with a stone. And so this represents the word of God. And uh, so you've got these two contrasting symbols. One is gold and silver. It's all the earthly treasure. But the other one is a stone. Ten commandments, the word of God, written on stone. And so right away, a, a Jew reading this would understand you've got two opposing elements that are here. Number six, what does the head of gold represent? Now we're going to start going through these different elements in the vision Find out point by point, what do they mean? Well, Daniel told the king very plainly when he interpreted it. Just read chapter 2 of Daniel. You'll have all this here. He said, thou art this head of gold. Now, gold, of course, is the most precious of the metals that you find in the vision. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of one of the most majestic empires in the world. I've got a few notes here from an ancient historian by the name of Herodotus. And he gives a description of what ancient Babylon was like. Let me read some of this to you. Babylon reached its glory during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar II. 
604 to 562 BC, was probably the largest city of antiquity. The entire city of Babylon was an immense square totaling 15 miles on each side. That's 60 miles around. Babylon, um, each side with a Marduk's temple and the Tower of Babylon at the center. The city was divided into two equal parts with the river Euphrates running under the walls. Notice that, it comes up later tonight. The river Euphrates running under the walls, which also served to irrigate and air condition the entire metropolis, had 25 avenues that were 150 feet wide. Only wish our streets were that wide. Which ran across the city from north to south. The same number crossed at right angles from east to west, making a total of 676 great blocks, three quarters of a mile each with smaller streets, of course, intersecting those. King Nebuchadnezzar also built massive fortifications with immensely thick walls that measured between 67 feet at the base to 54 feet at the top. And, you know, historians struggle with this, but Herodotus said 320 feet high. Now, when you see the pyramids, 600 feet high, you think, who knows? A lot of those bricks were taken after the fall of Babylon and used to rebuild other things, and they just all disappeared. And it tells us that uh, one historian said that four chariots could race atop of the walls of Babylon. Not only was Babylon big, it was beautiful. The public buildings were faced with bright glazed bricks. Now here's a picture of one of the gates, the Ishtar Gate, that has been carefully excavated in Babylon years ago and was rebuilt, reassembled in Berlin in a museum. And uh, just tell you something about the beauty of the city during this time. And it says the outer walls were yellow, the gates were blue, the palaces were rose red, and the temples were white. All this plus the famous hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. By the way, what happened is um, Nebuchadnezzar married a girl from the mountains, and she went to the plains of Mesopotamia. She became homesick because there was no mountains. It was flat everywhere. He said, I'll build you a mountain. So in the city, he built a mountain, and he planted it with trees and gardens from all over the known world. And then he had very clever pumps that were pumping water up to the top and creating waterfalls as it went down. And a number of historians said it was just so beautiful. One of the wonders of the world made his wife a mountain. This is Bachelor, don't get any ideas about that. All this splendor was unequal to any city. You can understand why Nebuchadnezzar at one point became so proud that he stood upon the balcony overlooking Babylon as the sun was going down. And he said, is this not great Babylon that I have built? There was gold everywhere. They had tons and tons of gold. Nebuchadnezzar comp conquered Jerusalem. He carried all the gold from Solomon's temple, which is tons of gold, carried it off to Babylon, and he conquered a lot of other nations and all the revenue from taxes, and it was immensely rich. It was the head of gold. Would Babylon's kingdom last forever? Well, we heard it, that the gold then transitioned into another metal, representing another kingdom. Now, the Bible goes into a lot of detail to tell us about this chest and arms of silver. It says, After thee will arise another kingdom inferior to thee, still mighty and powerful, but not nearly as powerful or strong as or glorious as that head of gold. And, you know, the Bible tells us how this all happened. Uh, you know, they were doing some excavating around Babylon, and they found a tablet that was inscribed by Nebuchadnezzar in uh, Es Algia, and the Babylonian tablet, it says, I have strengthened and established thy name uh, of my reign forever. He wanted his kingdom to last forever. We'll find out in another presentation about how he made an effort for it to last forever. But as we all know, Babylon did not last forever. And in the Bible, if you read in Daniel chapter 5, it tells you about the fall of Babylon. I think most of us have heard the expression before, handwriting on the wall. I didn't know what that meant most of my life until I picked up the Bible. And I found out that came from a story that you find in the Bible. Babylon, uh, finally, Nebuchadnezzar passed away. His son, uh, Evil Merodach, reigned for a little while. He was assassinated. And then Nabadonis reigned. And uh, the son of Nabadonis was Belshazzar. And while his father was out doing archaeology in other parts of the kingdom, he decided to have a wild party. And he wasn't at all concerned that the Medes and the Persians were threatening to attack because he said, they'll never get through the walls of Babylon. They're just like flies out there. We don't have to worry about the Persians and the Medes. So to show that he was unafraid, he had a big party. And he said, we've got enough 
food in the city to last us 20 years. And they did. They had quite a bit. Some of these sieges where one kingdom would surround another would last for years. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, it took him two years, camped outside Jerusalem to conquer the city. The Romans camped outside of Masada for three years. And so Belshazzar said, Cyrus the general and the Persians outside the city, they're never going to conquer us. They just don't have the economy to, to outlast us. So he had a big feast. And at some point they were throwing food over the walls to show the Persians they weren't afraid. But then they made a fatal mistake. During that feast, the king had heard that Daniel had foretold that the Babylonian kingdom would not last forever. He said, we'll show you whose God is more powerful, the God of Jehovah or the gods of Babylon. Send for the holy vessels that we captured from the temple in Jerusalem. And they brought these golden vessels in from Solomon's temple and they began to fill them with fermented drink and they began to toast and praise their gods of gold and silver and wood and stone. And while he was carrying on and blaspheming the God of heaven, suddenly a bloodless hand was illuminated and began to write on the plaster of the walls in this massive hall of Babylon. And they said they had a, a banquet hall that was a quarter of a mile long. There were peacocks carrying golden chariots with drink walking around. I mean, it was just so majestic. And there on that banquet hall, words began to write. And the Bible says the king's knees began to knock together and his loins were loose. Now that phrase, loins loose, it can be translated, he wet his pants. That's just what it means. He became so frightened that his knees began to shake. You didn't get a wide shot of that. Of that. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, he just, I mean, what would you do? He looked up and he sees these words, meeny, meeny, tickle you farson, writing on the walls. And the blood left his face. And then he says, Bring in the wise men. You think he would have learned from Nebuchadnezzar that they can tell me they came in. They had no idea what it meant, but they were just as scared. And finally, the queen mother said, you know, there is a man in your kingdom that your grandfather knew and even the wise men treated him like he was the wisest of the wise and he's still alive. Finally, the king calls in Daniel and Daniel says, I'll tell you what the writing is. The king says, I'll, I'll give you a reward. I'll make you third ruler in the kingdom. I'll give you a golden chain and Daniel says, keep your rewards because I know what the vision says and you really have nothing to offer me. And so he interpreted it for him. You've heard the expression, handwriting on the wall. The words, meanie, meanie, tickle you farson, it meant, meanie, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you are weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And the king, true to his word, he rewarded Daniel. But the very night when the king was doing that, Babylon had already begun to fall. And the fall of Babylon had been foretold in the Bible over 150 years earlier. You read in Jeremiah 25, 12, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I'll make it a perpetual desolation. Just a little... Interesting footnote I thought that you'd find uh, fascinating is, you know, when uh, Saddam Hussein, who was, of course, ruling in Iraq for years, and that's where the ancient city of Babylon is, he fancied himself the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, he told people, I'm Nebuchadnezzar the third, because the one in the Bible was Nebuchadnezzar the second. And uh, he used all this propaganda. He said he was related, though there is no, absolutely no documentation of that. And he tried. To, he he had Nebuchadnezzar's chariot reconstructed and took pictures of himself in there. He had coins stamped with his image, and he had the artist make sure that his face and portrait looked like Nebuchadnezzar's, so people would think that uh, he was some reincarnation of this ancient king. And one reason is because he knew the Jews said, "You're never going to unite the Arab world. Babylon, Iraq is never going to be a world empire." Because God said that that head of gold is going to pass away. And in the prophecies of Isaiah, it says it'll never be rebuilt. Take a look at some of these. Now, first of all, uh, Saddam Hussein, I should say, he tried to rebuild Babylon. He spent up to $500 million trying to restore the ruins of the ancient city. It was interrupted twice because of the two phases of the Gulf War. The final time, of course, it didn't end very well for him. He was arrested and ultimately executed. And this very day, the ruins are just that. They are ruins, as the Bible foretold. He tried to overthrow and confound the Bible prophecy, and you can't do that. 
Here's what Isaiah said about Babylon. Some people think Babylon's going to be rebuilt. You're not reading your Bibles. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Just go to the south end of the Dead Sea and you'll see there is nothing there. It'll never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pent pitch his tent there. It'll be full of nothing but doleful creatures. You know, it's interesting that it was situated where you would think it'd be a good place to rebuild a city. Many cities have been destroyed in war and then they rebuild them. Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt 27 times and it's still there. And it's up on a mountain. Babylon was by the Euphrates River. It was destroyed. It was never rebuilt. Here's uh, another prophecy. Jeremiah 50 verse 38. A drought is against her waters. And they will be dried up. Now, why does Jeremiah say that? The Bible even tells the who and the how Babylon would fall. You know, I mentioned the Euphrates River ran under the wall. And while Cyrus the general, he soon would be king, and his uh, father-in-law Darius the Mede, who was the first king, were encamped, started out the uh, Medo-Persian kingdom. Eventually, the Persians sort of absorbed the Medes, and it was known basically as the Persian kingdom. But... Um, Cyrus, uh, he wanted to conquer the city and he knew that it was going to be almost impossible to go over the walls. So he thought, well, but there is a weakness in that the river runs under the walls. Now, they didn't have scuba gear back then, but he got a brilliant idea, or someone gave it to him. There was a very large dry lake bed not far from the Euphrates, and it was lower than the river level. And he had his soldiers dig this massive trench that would divert the water of the Euphrates over to this dry lake bed. And then one day, just as the sun was going down, he had them break the final scoop of dirt out that sent the Euphrates rushing off into this dry area, this channel he'd prepared, lowered the water level. He had some soldiers go underneath the wall, and there was the inner gates and outer gates. The soldiers had been drunk from Belshazzar's party. They left the inner gates unlocked. They unlocked the inner gates, the outer gates. The army came pouring in. They had killed the guards, and the city was taken in one night. Just as the Bible has, had foretold. Notice that Jeremiah said, the waters will be dried up. Now, the waters of Euphrates are drying up now also, friends. And it mentions this in Revelation. talks about the sixth plague, the Euphrates drying up. And so uh, that will come up again a little later. It says, for it's the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. What did we say about idolatry as being one of the principal problems of Babylon? So they went under the walls, and they destroyed the city. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. Now, this is written in Isaiah 45. You read your Bibles. You know Isaiah lived and died long before they were even carried to Babylon. He lived long before Nebuchadnezzar, long before Cyrus. God names the one who would conquer Babylon and liberate his people by name, 150 years before he's born. Scholars that read the Bible are just so mystified by all of this because they think, how could this be that you could know someone's name, that they'd be the ruler with such precision? Thus says the Lord to his anointed, that means you're our chosen one, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings, and to open before him the double doors. These are the inner gates to the city. So the gates will not be shut. And this is exactly what happened historically. Indeed, you can go to the um, British Museum, and one of the great artifacts there, I've, I've been there, I've seen this, is the Cyrus Cylinder. And in this cylinder, in the cuneiform that they write there, he says how easily Babylon was taken, and that when he came into power, he let the captives of the Babylonians go free. That, of course, included the Jewish people. This all happened. And I just get excited thinking about it, how, how people would doubt the word of God in these prophecies. So that then transitions us into this next kingdom, the kingdom of Persia, which was also a mighty kingdom. Now notice something that's happening as we move along here. Each empire, you go from gold to silver, it's diminishing in value, increasing in strength. Silver is harder than gold. Bronze is harder than silver. See what I'm saying? The Persian empire had bigger borders than Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, each empire lasts longer than the one before it. So there's some very interesting sequences that are happening in this vision that are really uncanny. 
And uh, here's a picture of some of the ancient ruins of Persepolis, which is, I think, a Greek word. Polis meaning city. And I think it means city of the Persians. And it was their capital city. It was also very magnificent. And um, there are a number of rulers. Persia lasted a little longer than the Greek, uh, than the um, uh, Babylonian kingdom. And that was from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. And uh, then we go on to the next empire. Question eight. What metal would be represented in the kingdom that followed Medo-Persia? Well, you read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, another third kingdom of brass shall bear rule over all the earth. And every school child knows about Alexander the Great. And this is, was a great uh, a stretch of the, uh, the Greek influence and Hellenization that went throughout the Middle East and uh, parts of the Mediterranean back then. Arian, the Greek historian, said, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, or people, then being, where his name did not reach. The exploits and the, um, uh, the military genius of Alexander the Great have been noted by many in history, and he was so incredibly brave. Uh, his, his soldiers were so loyal that if he ordered some of them to march off a cliff, they would not question him. They would march off a cliff. Uh, and he was very good to him because he would lead them into battle. He didn't just say, go fight. He would often be on his horse charging. A couple of times, Alexander was the first one over the wall. They were so inspired by his courage. Once he nearly got killed, he was wounded badly. But he was extremely courageous. He almost felt like he was invincible. And uh, it's strange that he never did die in battle. I'm persuaded that the whole world had heard about him. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding over his birth and actions. Now, this is interesting. Historical library, even historians looking at the life of Alexander the Great, it seems like there was some divine hand. Now, some of them say it was the Greek gods, and some of them say, well, it was maybe the god of the Bible. They all disagree, but they say there, there are so many remarkable events in his life that look like there was some divine hand that was giving him victory over a much bigger army that the Persians had. You probably heard the story about the brave Greeks that fought there, the Spartans, against a massive force of Persians. Now, there's an interesting story from history that, uh, and you can read this in uh, the writings of Josephus, which, you know, you can find online, that when Alexander the Great finished conquering Tyre, it's interesting, all the other kings had tried to conquer Tyre, and they were unsuccessful because Tyre's capital was off the coast there, uh, north of Israel, and uh, it was on an island. And they were, the Phoenicians were really the masters of the sea. Alexander said, look, if we can't ca conquer it by, by sea, we'll conquer it by land. And the soldier said, well, how do you do that? He said, we're going to take the ruins of the ancient city of Tyre. We're going to push them off into the sea. We'll build a bridge, and uh, we'll connect it with land. And they did that. He was committed. If someone wouldn't surrender, he went after him. And they basically built, under constant fire from the people in the city, they built a causeway, and he conquered the city of Tyre. Well, at that time, he said, Jerusalem is next. But when he was on his way down to Jerusalem to conquer the Jewish nation, the priests, led under the high priest, they went out of the city. They came forward to them dressed in their, their holy vestments, and uh, they were bringing a scroll with them. And the king was so impressed when he saw them, he got off his horse. He walked up to the high priest, and his soldiers were amazed. He thought that the soldiers thought that he was going to attack them. He got off his horse, he walked up to the priest, and he bowed and he worshiped God. And his general later asked him, what were you doing? Why would you bow before me? He says, I wasn't worshiping the priest. I was worshiping his God. And the priest had these vestments on, and he was wearing the mitre and a little... Uh, gold plaque that said holiness to the Lord above his head. Alexander said, when I was in Macedonia, I had a dream. We talked about great monarchs having these, these prophetic dreams. He said, I had a dream, and a man dressed in these vestments told me, you must go forth and conquer the Persians. He said, I've never seen anyone in these vestments until now. Then the Persians, through a translator, showed him the scroll of Daniel, where in the scroll of Daniel, we haven't gotten there yet, but it actually mentions Greek, Greece as the kingdom that would rule and conquer the Persians. He saw that, and he did not attack Jerusalem. He let them go on in peace. And so uh, a very interesting bit of history. Well, he went on from there, and 
he eventually made his way to Babylon and he went all the way to the borders of India. I think I read somewhere that Alexander in 11 years marched his army 22,000 miles. And um, brilliant. <laughs> You've probably heard the story that says that uh, he realized there were no more worlds to conquer. So he just sat down, cried, and then he died. Well, that's not exactly what happened. But he did, he did want to keep fighting, and his soldiers had been away from home for years. They said, enough is enough. And so he settled in Babylon, and he had a drunken feast. And he either dried, died from alcohol poisoning, poisoning, someone may have tried to poison him, or from malaria, they're not sure. And as he was dying, uh, his generals and those around him asked, who will rule in your place? Because he had one son that was still very young. And Alexander said, the strongest. That's what happened. His kingdom was divided into four parts. Well, it's interesting that the, um, the Persians, their monetary system was silver. The Greeks, their armor was bronze. And so as you go from the gold, which was a primary currency there in Babylon, to the silver, primary currency for the, um, the Persians, the Greeks also did use copper in their currency, but they used bronze and, uh, in their uh, mail, in their armor, and the kingdom of Alexander, even bigger, lasted longer than the Persians. And again, bronze is harder than silver, but it did not last forever. He could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer himself. And then the period of Greece was 331 B.C. to about 168 B.C. when they engaged with the next world empire. And that's our question number nine. What metal represents the fourth kingdom? You can read here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. The fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron. And I think that uh, every schoolboy knows that um, the kingdom that followed Greece was the kingdom of Rome. In fact, you can read Edward Gibbons, who wrote that classic. And I'm sure nobody has read the whole thing, a few historians, but it's volumes. He spent his life writing The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He even said in there, the images, look at the language he used, the images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. See, Rome had mastered iron weaponry. They learned how to quickly reproduce iron. And if you had an iron sword in Bible times, you could fight against somebody with a bronze sword and you could actually cut their sword and break it. It was so much stronger. And we know that it was, uh, it was the iron weapons of the Romans that went into Bethlehem and killed the babies under the order of Herod. It was the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, that had Jesus whipped with an iron cat of nine tails. And it was Roman soldiers that were there driving the nails into his hands and feet, iron nails. There was a Roman soldier that took a spear and put it in his side and another Roman centurion that stood at the foot of the cross and said, truly, this was the Son of God. There's no question about who was ruling the world during this time. The iron monarchy of Rome. And there were Romans that were guarding the tomb when Jesus rose from the dead, praise God. But uh, they couldn't keep him in the grave, even though they put a Roman seal on his tombstone. The angel broke the seal, and Jesus came out. And I always wanted to see the look on Pilate's face when he got the news. Rome ruled from 168 B.C. to 476 B.C., a very powerful kingdom. Now, one reason I think that God waited until the time of the Romans before he sent his son into the world, during the reign of Augustus Caesar, they had what they called Pax Romana, the Roman peace. There was a period, because of the, the iron fist that Rome ruled with, of relative peace. And during that time, the roads, you've heard of the Roman roads, all roads lead to Rome, they developed the best communication system. Things where news could travel the fastest because of the roads and trade. And that was the best time to pour out the Holy Spirit because when the Jews at Pentecost came from all over the Roman Empire to worship and the Holy Spirit was poured out, they quickly scattered with the gospel message through those, Rome, those Roman roads all over the world. So uh, there was, of course, some brilliant design in Jesus coming during that time. But the Roman Empire, it also would not last. Not the Rome ruled by the Caesars. What would happen after the fall of the Roman Empire? It says the kingdom will be divided as the toes and feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly broken. 
Now, Rome was not really conquered by any one empire. It is true that the, the barbarians and the Huns, like Attila the Hun, they came and they wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire. But if you read in the Philip Myers, actually in Edward Gibbon's book first, he describes the five things that brought down the fall of the Roman Empire. And I think you're going to find this interesting. Because some of it, I think, we'll see in the world today. Five things that led to Rome's downfall. The undermining of the dignity and the sanctity of the home. The increasing taxes and spending of public money for bread and circuses. The mad craze for pleasure with sports becoming more exciting and more brutal. The building of armaments when the real enemy was the decadence of the people. The decay of religion with faith fading into mere form. Philip Meyer, in his book, Rome, The Rise and Fall, he made this observation about the Romans. Almost from the beginning, the Roman stage was gross and immoral. It was one of the main agencies to which must be attributed the undermining of what had originally been a sound moral life of the Roman society. During Octavian or Augustus Caesar, he, he was a strong general, but he believed in the importance of the family and the home and the marriage. But as the succeeding Caesar came along, uh, many of them were just so debauched like Nero that uh, they began to crumble. Rome was not destroyed from the outside. It eroded from the inside out. It says, So absorbed did the people become in the indecent representations of the stage they lost all thought and care for the affairs of real life. And, you know, they didn't even have HDTV back then. But they became so distracted with entertainment. You wonder what uh, that historian would say about the world today. You wonder how much longer any empire can last with what's going on in the world and the immorality. So Rome sort of disintegrated. And it fell into really ten different kingdoms. And just like the feet of the image, it says you get the ten toes and the feet were iron mixed with clay. Still had the Roman influence, the iron, but it was mixed with clay. And, uh, you know, the ancient names were the Vandals in North Africa, the Lombards in Italy, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, the Alamanni, Burgundians, the Franks. That's what we call the French. The Alamanni would be the Germans, Anglo-Saxons, Visigoth, the Suevi, the Portuguese, and the Spanish. And those are the, of course, more modern names. But now that brings us down to we're in the last element here, which is the feet of iron and clay. Now I think it's very interesting, the feet of iron and clay. Here's a little amazing fact. This is the uh, Pantheon, and it's one of the uh, oldest uh, concrete buildings in the world. This was built uh, from ancient Roman cement, but it was not reinforced. It's 2,000 years old. Augustus Caesar still built it, and incredibly it survived several earthquakes. It's still there today and uh, really makes you wonder. It wasn't until about 1867 that reinforced concrete was developed. Let me share with you a little amazing fact about that. Um, here, concrete is used more than any other man-made material in the world. Why am I saying this? What is concrete? What did Daniel see? The feet are made of iron and miry clay. I wonder how a prophet would describe the world's number one building material today. Concrete is used more than any other man-made material in the world. In addition, concrete is the second most consumed substance in the world. I don't mean people eat it. Behind water. The industry alone is worth over 37 billion. It employs more than 2 million employees in the United States. 10 billion tons of concrete are produced every year. It is the number one building material in the world and all over the world. Now the empires are built out of iron and miry clay. Very interesting. So would these kingdoms, let me back up and read my question 11 again, would these 10 kingdoms ever succeed in uniting again? What did the prophets say? They will mingle themselves with the seed of men. That means they intermarry with their descendants. But they will not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. You break up any concrete, you'll still find the iron, you'll still find the, the clay. <laughs> they, don't, they don't blend like oil and water. Just one little footnote from history. Queen Victoria, until Queen Elizabeth II, who's the current queen, she was the longest reigning queen in history. I think it was 63 years was her reign. Her descendants, including 40 grandchildren, 
married into almost every royal family in Europe. They were trying desperately to reunite Europe. They were so tired of war. They said, if we just all intermarry, we can have a lasting peace. But it didn't work. They tried to mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's exactly what happened during that time. There were all these arranged marriages, whether they liked each other or not, whether they even saw each other or not, between the Spanish and the English and the Germans and the Swiss and all these different empires trying to forge through marriage some alliance. But it kept evolving into war. And you can just look at the history books. Everybody from Attila the Hun, the Charlemagne, Napoleon, Hitler, Kaiser Wilhelm. You know what the word Kaiser means? It's a German for Caesar. You know what the word Tsar means? It's Russian for Caesar. They all wanted to reforge that Roman Empire. And the Roman influence, the iron, was still mixed through it all. The calendar, many of the governments were based on the Roman foundations. So now that brings us down to the very ends of time. Who will set up the final kingdom? It says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now this is talking about that stone that comes from the heavens, cut without man's hands, that will destroy the idol. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself, we're back in Revelation where we started, he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He's going to destroy. The only thing you can destroy iron with is more iron. And Jesus' kingdom is the one that's going to last forever. What does the stone do to the other world kingdoms? It says, the stone that was cut without hands, notice that without hands again, which smote the image upon the feet. That means it's going to happen in the last days. This is not talking about the iron when Christ came the first time. It's talking about the feet when Christ comes the second time. Smite them on the feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Notice it says, without hands. I want you to notice what Jesus said yeah, at his trial. They said, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands and within three days I will build another one without what? Without hands. This is talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. And he's going to come and he will then wipe out the kingdoms of the world and his kingdom will be eternal and it fills the whole earth. The Bible tells us that he creates a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. Mountains in the Bible were often symbols of kingdoms. And it fills the whole earth. There's no competition. Not mountains. There's one mountain. One people. And if you want to be in that kingdom, you need to be part of that people. So let's quickly review what we saw here in the history. The vision said you'd have gold, which is what kingdom? Babylon. Silver is Medo-Persia. Bronze is Greece. Iron is Rome. The iron and clay. Divided kingdom of Europe. And the great stone is Christ's kingdom. Everything happened in order. And again, you, won't, you don't miss this. Each kingdom lasts longer than the one before. Each kingdom is harder than the one before. And uh, also you're, you're realizing that um, the value of the earthly kingdoms, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, they're diminishing in value. And the finally one that is of eternal value is the stone, Christ the rock of ages. You know, friends, after hearing uh, Daniel's clear interpretation, this is question 14, it's really an appeal. What did the dream of Daniel, after he heard the dream, what did Nebuchadnezzar say about the Lord? The king answered and said to Daniel, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. You know, can you imagine the, the expression on the king's face? When... Uh, Daniel not only said, well, here, let me tell you what the dream was. And then he says, now I'm going to tell you the interpretation. As Daniel was relating the dream, I'm sure that the glint of recognition was in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. He said, yes, yes, that's it. And he was just probably mystified. He wanted to worship Daniel and burn incense to him when he saw that here this man had the knowledge of the gods revealed to him. This dream has played out perfectly in history. Daniel goes on to say, the dream is certain. And the interpretation is sure. It's like John, when he closes the book of Revelation, he says, I, John, have seen these things, and these words are true. Friends, you can believe the word of God. Nothing happening in the world today has surprised the Lord. Everything has happened right on schedule. 
And I hope that you'll realize the next thing on the agenda, according to this vision, is Christ is coming very soon. Now, there are a few other things that are going to be happening that are some specifics we'll be studying during the seminar. But I just want you to know that um, it's not going to fail. Now, let me illustrate real quick in closing. Suppose I say I want you to come visit uh, Mrs. Batchelor and I up in the hills. I won't give the exact address, dear, so stay with me. Um, and I say, okay, well, you, you get out on Interstate 5 and you drive north until you get to the town of Willows. And there at Willows, you're going to see a 90-foot-tall statue made of gold, and it'll say Highway 162 uh, Babylon. And you turn left there. So you, you drive up the road, and sure enough, there's Willows. There's, you don't see too many 90-feet-tall statues that are gold that say Babylon. And you say, this is it, turn left. You turn left. And then I say you drive for an hour, and you're going to come to a 90-foot statue that says Persian Road, and you turn right there. You drive an hour, and there you are, 90-foot statue of silver, Persian Road. You say, well, must be, <laughs> that can't be on the wrong track, can I? Don't see that every day. Turn right. And then I say, another hour. What are you going to see? So you're going to end up seeing a 90-foot statue of bronze, and it says Greek Road, and you turn there. And then I say, you go another hour, and then you're going to see a statue of iron, and it says the Roman road, turn left here. And then you go another hour, and you're going to see a statue of iron and clay, 90 feet tall. You turn right here, it's going to say iron and clay. And then I say, now at the end of that road, you're going to find my home. Who would doubt after everything along the directions has played out exactly as I said, that the last part would fail? Friends, God has perfectly outlined what's happening in the world from the days of Daniel to our present day. And I should mention right here, someone's going to say, well, Pastor Doug, how come this vision doesn't talk about the other great empires? Wasn't there a great empire in the, the Incas and Aztecs and in and, and, and China? And there were other empires in the world, in India. That's true. This is dealing with the empires that had power over God's people. And so that's why they were emphasizing this is exactly what happened in history, friends. Why would we doubt the last part, that Jesus is coming again? The next thing on the list is Jesus is going to return. And that is good news. It's good news if you're part of his kingdom. When Jesus opened his mouth and started preaching, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 2,000 years ago, you could choose to become a citizen of that kingdom. And right now we're ambassadors in a foreign country. But soon Jesus is going to come and he's going to conquer all the kingdoms of this world. And he will ultimately create a new heaven and a new earth. You want to be part of that kingdom. Only way that that happens, friends, is you come to Christ and you ask him to be your savior, to forgive your sins and to fill you with his spirit. He promises that you can be born again. You, he wants you to be in that kingdom. He died to make it possible. I hope that you'll ask him right now. Let me pray with you before we close this segment. Don't go anywhere because Pastor Ross and I will be back afterward with Bible questions. Father in heaven, we're very thankful that you've given us the truth in your word and these powerful prophecies that are so exceedingly clear. Lord, we know the next thing to happen is your kingdom's going to come, that all the idols and the false religions and the confusion of the world is going to be ground to powder and blow away, but your kingdom will be that one which lasts from everlasting to everlasting. I pray that we can choose now to be inducted into that kingdom through the blood of your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. We'll be right back, friends. Don't go anywhere. Bible questions in just a moment. It's the longest river in the world, the Nile, over 4,250 miles long. But the amazing thing was, even the kingdom of Egypt did not know what was the source of the Nile. For thousands of years, people around the Mediterranean, Europe, they all wondered where the Nile River actually came from. There were some amazing, crazy theories. Some thought that it went underground for hundreds of miles and came back up again. They even sent armies to find the source but they could never find the source of the main tributary. It wasn't until 1863 when John Hanning Speak went on an expedition from England and he discovered 
the largest lake in Africa and the second largest freshwater lake in the world next to Lake Superior in North America. He named it after the Queen of England, Lake Victoria. And what's really important, he found where the water ran out of Lake Victoria, forming the source of the White Nile. People had been looking for it for thousands of years. A few years later, in 1872, when Henry Morton Stanley, the one who's famous for finding David Livingston when he was missing, he explored the entire circumference of the lake, confirming that it was the source of the Nile. You know, friends, in the Gospel of John, chapter four, it tells about a woman that came to a well to just get a drink of average water. But there she met Jesus, who is the living water. He said, the water that you're drinking now, it's gonna leave you thirsty again. You'll need to just keep coming. You'll never be satisfied. But I am the source of living water that will be an artesian well of life springing up in your heart. And he offered her this living water. Friends, he's offering all of us this living water that comes from accepting Jesus. Have you discovered the source? Hello, friends. We want to welcome you all back. Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome you all back to Revelation Now. And Pastor Doug, it's been a great study looking at Daniel chapter 2. And now we're getting into our Bible questions. We've had a lot of questions of folks uh, that have come in. Uh, just before we get to your questions, um, oh, let me remind you, if you'd like to ask a question, just go to the um, Facebook page, and you can actually type it right there in the comment section, and we'll try and answer as many questions as we can. I uh, want to remind you of our free offer for today. It is a book entitled uh, The Last Night on Earth. And if you'd like to receive this, you can just go to the Revelation Now website. You can download it. Or if you like, you can text the word EARTH to the number 40544. You'll be able to get a digital copy of the book, and I think you'll really enjoy reading it, and a lot of good information. Amen. So make sure you take advantage of that. All right, Pastor Doug, well, we're ready for our uh, Bible questions. and no, uh, Just give me a second here. Karen, can you come up here? She gave me a cough drop just between programs. I don't want to swallow it. I might choke on it, but I, can't, I don't want to <laughs> chew it up. You only do this to your <laughs> wife. Sorry, dear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're good now. I'm ready. <laughs> uh, it's proof that this is live. So uh, there you know. Uh, we do have some questions that uh, we're going to start by putting up one of the questions that's come in. And uh, Marsha, you can do that at this time. The question is, um, when will Christ set up his kingdom on the earth? Well, that's a great question because when you talk about the kingdom of uh, Jesus, there's really two aspects of it. You have the spiritual kingdom that technically has been around ever since the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve offered the lamb, they accepted the sacrifice of God's son that would come, they would be forgiven based on faith. Uh, you know, Abraham was part of that kingdom. It came more vividly when Jesus came the first time, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was preaching that, as was John the Baptist, uh, meaning within reach, the spiritual kingdom, the literal kingdom, where Jesus actually creates a new heaven and a new earth, uh, that's going to happen. Well, God's people are taken to the mansions he's prepared at the second coming. And then New Jerusalem says that kingdom comes down in Revelation chapter 21 following the millennium. Mm -hmm. So there's these phases of reality in the kingdom. We become citizens now in the kingdom when we accept Jesus. But uh, there's still wars in this life. And I believe we have a whole presentation coming that's going to be talking about that 1,000-year period, right. the millennium. So stay tuned for that. Uh, our next question that we have uh, for this evening, it says, what kind of bodies will people have in God's new kingdom? And again, we've got a lesson that will go into more detail talking about what Revelation says about the, the resurrection and uh, eternal life. But uh, we're not ghosts. You know, people often think, I'm not so sure I want to go to heaven and, and be a baby naked fat cherub on a cloud strumming a harp. Or, a harp or, and that's not at all what it's like. Uh, Jesus in Philippians, it says, we will have bodies likened to his glorious body. And in the resurrection, when he appeared to the disciples in the upper room, he said, touch me, mm -hmm. feel me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see that I have. Then he said, I'm hungry. Do you have anything to eat? And matter of fact, two or three times when he appeared to the disciples, he ate. He showed them he was very real. And so as when God created Adam and Eve, they had real bodies. In the world made new, we've got real bodies, but they've got the added spiritual dimension that we've lost because of sin. Okay. 
And we have one more question before we go to the questions that have been sent in through Facebook. The question is, what part does free choice have in determining who will be saved and who will be lost? Yeah, I saw that question. I thought, well, this has been a big debate of Christianity for millennia right now, the last 2,000 years, the, the subject of uh, uh, God's sovereign power and free will. And uh, there is no question that God is sovereign, but it's also true that do God does give people choice and that uh, you know, we're saved by his grace and his, um, God is very clear that his providence does intervene in our lives as he did with the Apostle Paul and the thief on the cross. But then we make choices. That's why Joshua said, choose ye today who you will serve. And Christ says, whosoever will, let him, he's given us a will, we can choose. Now God knows what people will choose because he knows everything. But because he knows it, doesn't mean he's taken away their ability to choose. And so it is important for us to preach the gospel to people. I've heard some people say, well, God's going to save who he's going to save. And if I have no choice, I'll just wait and see what happens. Now, you do need to make a choice. You need to choose to come. And that's very important to understand. You know, we do have a book that folks can read for free yes. online. And it's called, Can a Saved Man Choose to be Lost? Just go to the Amazing Facts website. You click on the free uh, library resource and mm -hmm. you can read the book. Can Absolutely, that's man perfect. to be lost. All right, going into some of the questions that have come in through Facebook. Um, this is a question that ties in a little with last night's presentation. It says, I have a question. Is the second coming and the rapture the same event? Well, uh, yes. Well, when Jesus comes, first of all, the, the first coming, of course, is when Christ came as our sacrifice. He came as a lamb. He came quietly and meekly. And, uh, but the, the Jewish leaders, many of them, even the apostles, they thought he was coming like a conquering king the first time. Because there are prophecies in the Bible about, that talk about Christ coming as a uh, conquering king. That's the second coming. Mm -hmm. um, so he came as a lamb, but they got the, the, the lamb and the lion mixed up. And now Jesus is coming like a lion next time. And many people think he's coming quietly. It'll be a secret rapture. But when he comes next time, you can read it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That's the rapture. So when Jesus comes with that trump, the shout, the, the, um, the loud noise, the roar, that's when we're caught up to meet him in the air. We are transformed and given glorified bodies, and that is the rapture. It is following the tribulation. That's why he says, he that endures to the end mm -hmm. will be saved. Mm -hmm. All right, we got a question that's coming from uh, Paul, who is in Mexico. He is nine years old. And here's his question. It says, are God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus three persons or one person? I'm confused. It is, and don't feel badly. A lot of people struggle with this issue. But I, I think the Bible is very clear that there are three distinct persons in what we would call the Godhead. Folks are sometimes thrown because Jesus and Moses, you know, they say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. One for the Hebrews did not mean numerical quantity. Uh, you know, the Bible says a man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife, and they too become one. And in John 17, Jesus prayed for the apostles, Father, that they might be one as we are one. Well, we know the apostles, there were 12 of them after Judas was replaced. And uh, that means that Jesus is separate, the Father is separate, but they are one. At the baptism, we see God the Father saying, this is my son. Well, you've got two different places. Then you have God the Spirit coming down like a dove. And so we believe there are three distinct persons in what we would call the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, perfectly one and united, but they are three distinct persons with dis distinct offices. And I think we've got a book on that too, if people want. That's right. It's called... The Trinity is a biblical. Yep. And again, just go to the Amazing Facts website and you can read the book. You know, Pastor Doug, if I remember correctly, I believe that in the Hebrew language, there are actually different words used that's translated as one. In the Hebrew, there is a plural form of the word one. Mm -hmm. There is a singular form, but also plural. So as you said, one could mean one in purpose, united, not necessarily numerical oneness. Good point. And in Genesis, when God creates, he says, let us. Mm -hmm. There's a plural form of God there. Yeah. Let us make man in our image. And he says it again in Genesis 11. The man has become like us. So yeah, I think there's all the way from Genesis to Revelation, you can see the three persons of the Godhead. 
All right. We've got somebody asking, why do things come in threes in Revelation? Speaking of threes, well, you know, we may as well just unpack, uh, talk about Bible numbers for a minute. And this may come up again, so I, I hope you can uh, bear with us if we do some repetition. But there are certain numbers that have meanings. In Revelation, the number 12 comes up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, it's often a number for the church. You've got the leadership of the church, 12 apostles, 12 judges, 12 tribes. The church lives in a city that is 12,000 furlongs with 12 gates and tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit, 12 times a year, 144. So you got 12 as the church. Uh, seven is representing God's perfection, a perfect cycle, the week. And in Revelation, you're going to have to help me, Pastor Ross. We've got seven trumpets, seven churches, seven plagues, seven, seven seals, thunders. seven eyes, seven horns. I know I'm forgetting some. Seven thunders. Seven thunders. Yeah, Let's seven. Just get your. All over. Yeah, you get your computer out and you'll see a lot of sevens. Seven plagues. I don't know if you mentioned plagues. I yeah, know. a lot of sevens. And then you have three. Three is a number that is sort of like, um, it's a number talking about God. You've got, you know, uh, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in Revelation, every time you see three, doesn't mean God. It seems like the, you've got a counterfeit trinity in Revelation of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And when the judgment comes, the city is divided in three parts. So you see three all the way through the, uh, the book of Revelation. And later we'll talk about the number 666 and some of the other numbers. Maybe we'll just mention one number, Pastor Doug, since you bring it up. The number two in the Bible, significant. You've got the two witnesses. Yeah. Actually, that's in Revelation chapter 11. We had a question about that. You've got the number four, which represents the four points of the compass. The reason that's significant is because Revelation chapter 7 talks about angels holding the four corners of the earth. Yes. So, um, and there's others. And two is the word of God. That's right. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, ten commandments on two tables of stone, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Five is teaching, but we'll get to all okay. that later on. <laughs> we all can right, talk about numbers all night long. <laughs> <laughs> this person is asking, um, how do we know if a dream is important or have or is significant? Well, that is a good question. And, and uh, <laughs> I, get a, I get a lot of calls every now and then. People say, Pastor Doug, I have a dream. Can you tell me what it means? And I'll tell you, friends, I, I don't know that I've ever been accused of having the gift of interpretation. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes I think God does speak to people through dreams. And I think that if he gives you a dream that's from him, it will be very vivid and very clear and very real. And God will either give you someone to understand the dream or he'll give you the understanding. You know, sometimes God will give us a dream that's frightening. It's a warning. And you know that God was telling you something in a dream. And, um, I, you know, I know some people that dreamed that they were lost and Jesus came. And they woke up and they were so thankful that it, had, it was just a dream. Mm. And they had a chance. After I quit smoking, I was really tempted for a long time to start again. It was a big battle for me. And I dreamed that I'd started smoking again. And I was so ashamed. And I woke up and I was so glad it was a dream. I never did smoke again. <laughs> so God, like he, he told me, dream, you don't want to do this. Think about the shame that you'll feel. So it might be personal. And so if God gives you a dream, he'll either let you know or he'll send somebody. He won't give you a message and not have you able to understand it. Okay. We have another question that's coming. It says, uh, Pastor Doug, what about people who are struggling with mental illness as it relates to their salvation? Well, God is good. You know, he, he uh, to mu whom much is given, much is required. And if... If we have, you know, great understanding, we should be responsible for that. People who are young or they're handicapped and they just can't comprehend the, the issues of right and wrong and what's at stake in those decisions, God's very merciful. And so I don't think we ever have to worry about him, you know, judging people that way. And, you know, even I know some good Christians, they get old and they struggle with dementia and it's clearly a physical problem. Their brain has been affected. Their behavior may change. And the... Uh, the cerebrum is, is it the cerebellum in the front. Cerebrum is no longer controlling the, the rational things are being controlled by a lower nature. And God knows that. He's going to judge them based on the tenor of their life. And mm -hmm. So don't worry. God is merciful. Okay. He's just. We've got a couple questions that's coming about Revelation. And um, the question is, can you tell us more about the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11? Yes. And, and you know, I don't think we have a specific lesson on that. So we'll take a moment. Um, this is very important. Some people believe that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And in a sense, they are. Now, stay with me. 
Last prophecy in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, says, Remember the law of Moses? Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. They represent the word of God. Moses is the law. Elijah is the prophets. They appear to Jesus on this Mount of Transfiguration in Mark chapter 9. And so when it talks about the two witnesses in Revelation 11, it says they've got power to proclaim plagues, to shut up the heavens so it doesn't rain. And both Moses and Elijah, they, they sent fire. Fire came down for both of them. There were plagues. Elijah pray, prayed and it didn't rain. He prayed again and it did rain. And so you see the power of the word of God in their teaching. Now it says that these two witnesses, that uh, they're slain and their bodies lie in the street. Some people think that Moses and Elijah are going to come back down to earth and they're going to be killed and lie in the street. No, they've got glorified bodies. They're in heaven now. They're not going to die again. Uh, it's talking about what they represent. The word of God will be under attack in the last days. And many scholars that believe in the historic view of uh, prophecy, uh, they interpret that Revelation 11 is talking about the birth of atheism mm -hmm. when it became the first nation that officially declared there is no God they burned Bibles, the Word of God, in the streets. For three and a half years, they outlawed the Word of God and says their bodies lie in the street for three and a half days. Day and prophecies a year. And so that's a, a short answer. I could say more. But and so we do have a book on that, Pastor Doug. I think it's called The Two Witnesses. Yes. And again, it's free. Just go to the Amazing Facts website and you can read it there. Just click on the free library. They can download it, yeah. Yes. Another revelation question. It says... Who are the beasts of Revelation chapter 4? All I right. Think it's and referring to the four living creatures around the yes, throne. Yes, yeah, and you'll also find them mentioned in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 1. It talks about these creatures. Remember I said, Revelation, you can also find it's, it's sort of like a, a reflection of the Old Testament. And you've got a lion, an eagle, a calf, and a man. I'm looking at Pastor Ross, make sure I get my beast right. And uh, they, they, they have these faces. Now, in Revelation, keep in mind, these are symbols. It doesn't mean God in heaven is surrounded with a barnyard of animals. Each of those animals had sim a symbolism in the Bible. Eagles for their, their vision, their power in flight. They could go higher than any creature. They could see farther. The calf was a sacrifice, and it was also a beast of strength and service. And the man made in God's image, and the lion was, you know, one of the, the the majestic beast, and he's even a type of Christ in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You had an interesting... Uh, yeah, if you look at the, f the, the order that the Bible gives us in Revelation chapter 4 of the four living creatures, the first is likened to a lion. Some have seen in that Christ prior to the incarnation. He is mm -hmm. the king of kings, mm -hmm. is in heaven. Uh, and then it says that uh, the next eagle is a calf or an ox. And so when Jesus came to this earth, he came to bear our sins and die a sacrifice for mm -hmm. us. Uh, the third living creature has the face likened to a man and some seeing that Christ resurrected now as a high priest ministering for us in heaven. And the fourth living creature is like an eagle symbolizing Jesus coming as king of kings to execute judgment upon the mm -hmm. wicked. Yeah. And so in the four living creatures they have actually seen the plan of redemption played out. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of an interesting study. Again, Revelation is filled with symbols. Uh, and, yeah. there's and there's so layers and layers yep. of this. Absolutely. I heard one person say that you know there's four gospels. Mm -hmm. Four gives you eternal perspective. We just mentioned the four angels. Four directions represent something that's universal. And it's also telling us about the universal dominion of God. In the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Matthew shows Jesus, as you said, he's the lion, the king. Mark shows Jesus, it's the quickest gospel, he's the eagle. Uh, Luke shows Jesus, who is the man. Luke is the physician, mm -hmm. talks about the humanity. And John shows Jesus as the lamb, the sacrifice, the calf uh, of God. So... Uh, yeah, you see the whole gospel in there. Okay. Uh, We've got another question that's coming. It says, Pastor Doug, how long will be the tribulation period? Good question. Now, there, all churches agree, or most Christian churches agree, that there is going to be a great tribulation. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 24, in Mark chapter 13, in Luke chapter 21, Luke 17, and if you read in Daniel chapter 12, Michael stands up and there's a time of trouble such as there never has been. There is going to be a very serious time of trouble in the future. I don't worry about that. I just worry about being faithful. You don't find a verse anywhere that says, and it will be seven years. But people always talk about the seven years of tribulation. It could be. We don't know. I seriously doubt the great time of trouble. And I should add the two times of trouble. You've got one time of trouble, which is sort of the preliminary where God's people are preaching 
There's going to be laws restricting worship where you cannot buy or sell. But then finally, when it gets to a death decree, that's when the great time of trouble comes. That's when the seven plagues fall. Now, I don't think seven years are going on during the seven plagues because you look at the intensity. Mm -hmm. Water is blood. You have nothing to drink. And um, the plagues that fell on Egypt, which were like the seven plagues, they happened in a matter of months, mm. uh, several weeks. Uh, those ten plagues, these seven plagues, you know, it's probably a matter of weeks. The plagues that came to Job, a matter of weeks. But the small time of trouble, it's going to be maybe a few years. Mm. It gives us a chance to still preach. People will be coming into the church. Some will get discouraged and lose their faith, fall out of the church. That may be a period of a few years. We don't know. And Revelation talks about judgments or plagues coming upon Babylon. It says a plague shall come in about one day. Yeah. You know, one prophetic day equals one literal year. So that's why some are thinking perhaps it's within a year. Uh, another question that's come in. It, uh, do we know how or do we know anything about how Jesus looked when he was on the earth? Yes, he looked very normal. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, even when they wanted to arrest him, they said, Judas, which one is he? Yeah, I mean, Jesus seemed to melt into the crowd. And he went quietly to the feast. Sometimes they took up stones to stone Jesus, and he would sort of melt in the crowd. He wasn't walking around wearing, you know, some kind of fabulous robes as he sometimes is portrayed. Um, the Bible says there's no outward beauty that we should desire him. He did have a beard. The Bible says they plucked out his beard. Mm -hmm. So we know that. doesn't tell us what color his hair was. He had evidently looked like a, a Galilean. And so uh, yeah, he, he looked like a, a typical Jew of the day because he seemed to melt right in with his, his followers. Okay, next person he's asking, um, are we entering into the time of trouble? Oh, I think yeah, we've all been asking ourselves that question. Um, well, you know... I, I think that it's, I think it's going to be more severe than this. But are we entering into it? It seems that way to me. Mm. Uh, I've been personally uh, very um, troubled at how quickly we have lost freedoms. Mm. And, but, you know, nobody, nobody wants to say that some of these things aren't justifiable. Nobody wants to be guilty of exacerbating a pandemic and being a, a one-man pathogen and going around and saying, well, I want my freedom, so I'm going to infect everybody. But w we see that when it's, um, it's broadcast in a certain way, people will say, I'm willing to surrender certain freedoms. And that always is a cause for concern. I, I think it was, I don't remember if it was Jefferson or Franklin that said, if we are willing to sacrifice freedoms for a sense of security, we will end up with neither freedom or security. And so uh, I, I, that is one of my big concerns. Uh, you know, in some ways, uh, this time of trouble for some people, it's been very difficult. And, you know, I, I was concerned when, when I saw uh, that there was a toilet paper shortage in North America. I wasn't concerned about that, but I was concerned. Look at the panic. Mm -hmm. People stripping shelves of spaghetti, rice, and toilet paper. And I thought, and there was no shortage. <laughs> I mean, they were still making toilet paper, and they were still farming rice, and all that stuff was still available, but people panicked. And they stripped the shelves. I thought, what happens if, heaven forbid, there is some kind of a, a fuel shortage? Or highways, if trucks can't deliver. In some of these cities, we've seen rioting and great unrest. And I thought, boy, it just shows you how quickly things can implode. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think that, boy, you know, this is a great time to say I want to get right with God because you don't know how much time anybody has. Okay. Well, again, we want to thank those who are joining us on the various outlets, uh, participating in our study. And I want to remind you, we're going to be back tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Pacific time for another study in God's Word. Until then, God bless.